you can. Perfect. So thank you so much for having me and uh, welcome everybody from uh, all over the world. Uh, like I said, I'm located currently in Florida. And so I just got back. I was in Europe for the last two weeks uh, in Switzerland as well. So I'm happy to be back and excited to share some of the latest updates on hyaluronic acid. Um, I've also added a few slides at the end on another uh, biomaterial that I think is extremely interested. It's called Asopia. It's not available yet in the United States, but uh, I think it will have a, a large impact on uh, regeneration. So just to give everybody a little background about myself and kind of what I do that's different from uh, most people. I'm Canadian. I grew up in Canada. Um, and I spent my years in Canada doing uh, sciences, so medical sciences, um, and then I went on and did dentistry in Canada as well. Uh, during this time, I also was doing a, a master's in oral implantology, so in implant dentistry, and we were affiliated with the ITI. Um, I ended up winning a big scholarship in Canada that allowed me to go anywhere in the world, uh, fully funded, so a full scholarship. I decided to go to Bern, Switzerland, um, where I did my PhD, and I spent seven years there from 2009 to 2016, kind of going back and forth and doing a lot of research on bone grafts. Um, and it's kind of how I got involved in a lot of this research. Uh, this is the University of Bern, where I, I lived and spent most of my time. Um, and of course, we have a very reputable school. I give a lot of credit to uh, my PhD mentors as well as supervisors and chairs of their department. So this is Tony Schoolian. I'm sure a lot of you guys know him. He's one of the top uh, periodontist of the world and has done a lot of work as well with hyaluronic acid and with our group, as well as Dr. Boozer, who's done a lot of work in the implant field. Um, in 2016, I decided to move back to United States. So I'm, I'm Canadian. Uh, a lot of Canadians actually retire in Florida. So my parents live in Florida. I decided to come down here. My brother lives here as well. I want to be close to my family. Um, I had a name, a lab that was named after me. So it's called the Myron Lab. And of course, this is where we've done most of our research over the last little while. One of the interesting things for us working in research, of course, is that our region in Florida has five to six million people in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area, which is basically the entire size of Switzerland. And so we have a lot of possibility to continue with uh, clinical trials, et cetera, uh, in the area. Now, many of you guys probably know me from the work that we've done with Play the Rich Fibrin. So the first textbook that I wrote was on Pure F. Um, and more recently, this book here, it's called Next Generation Biomaterials. I would say this is my most significant contribution that I wrote with Yufeng uh, Zhang in China. He worked with us in Switzerland as well. And uh, what we proposed doing in the book was kind of explaining uh, most of our research that we've done in a lab and try and bring it to clinical applications. And so just to give people an idea, um, a lot of biomaterials are always being tested and they need to be tested in preclinical studies before they're ever introduced into clinics. And it takes a long time to transfer this new knowledge to clinical application. And the perfect example that I can give you is that I routinely run uh, Play the Rich Fibrin courses here in the United States. And some people are learning it for the very first time in 2019 or 2020 will be next year. And uh, this technology was really brought to market in 2006. And, you know, 14 years have gone by and still there's a lot of people that are still not using kind of these new biomaterials. And so this book, basically what the book proposed was what are the standard materials today? And so here we can see, you know, what grafting materials we're using, uh, what barrier membranes we're using and growth factors that are commonly available. And then it kind of proposed kind of the next generation material and, and where the field is going. And so more into 3D printing. Uh, you'll see here Asopia, which is the osteoinductive material. Uh, that Regadent carries and so we've done a lot of work with that grafting material as well um, Kind of the membranes and the work we've done with pure F and then one of the biggest changes I see in the regenerative field is all the work that's being done today with growth factors And so the focus today of course is on hyaluronic acid I think it's an extremely interesting material has a lot of applications uh, For use and I'm really happy to share kind of the new data and kind of the new indications related to uh, where we can use it now for those that have not had a chance to see the biomaterial book, um, I'll show a lot of cases as well as data from the actual textbook itself. Um, it was launched by Quintessence earlier this year, and I was surprised to find out actually that the book is uh, on the Quintessence webpage is the most sold book today in, in dentistry. And so it's interesting because as uh, was explained to me by Quintessence, you know, there's been a lot of textbooks that have been written and dedicated to implants, to, you know, grafting, GBR, uh, sinus grafting. There's a lot of books that are related to those topics, but there's never really been 
one textbook dedicated to biomaterials. And so this is kind of a first of its kind, and I think it's got a lot of applications. And so we explain in the book how biomaterials work, what they're used for, and then we present what the clinical indications are for um, the different biomaterials. So in it, of course, uh, hyaluronic acid had a whole chapter dedicated to it. It's one of the biggest chapters of the book, and it's near the end of the book where the next generation biomaterials are. And I want to present what it is, uh, what the background is, and where it can be used in dentistry. So hyaluronic acid itself has been around and, and determined a long time ago. So we've known about it for you know, 80 years, since the 30s. Uh, Carl Mayer, Mayer is the one who discovered it and, and discussed it. Um, it's unique in that it's a glyco, uh, glycosaminoglycan. And so a lot of people are using it today for its ability to uh, absorb water. Um, and I'll explain kind of the main indications where it's utilized. So that being facial aesthetics is where you see a lot of people using hyaluronic acid. And the reason why is because it's absorbing water, it's able to hydrate skin. And when you hydrate skin, you can get rid of wrinkles and keep your skin looking more quote unquote younger. And it's also used a lot in, uh, in knee regeneration for osteoarthritis. One of the things that I wanna share is the data today that we have on its ability to reduce scar formation. Uh, during wound healing. And that's where I think a lot of these expert clinicians such as Tony Schoolian and Andrea Poloni, you know, they really see fantastic results because you can literally uh, reduce and in some cases eliminate some of the scars that occurs when you make um, some of these incisions. Um, so hyaluronic acid itself, it's an extracellular matrix protein. So it's found in basically any single connective tissue of the body. And again, it binds to water and it allows the transport of key uh, metabolites. And one of the things that I showed two, three years ago was its ability to inhibit uh, MMPs, which basically degrade tissues. And when we were doing more and more research on its ability to degrade or inhibit MMPs, uh, it therefore, it led to some projects related to diabetes. Because, of course, we know today with diabetes, uh, tissues degrade faster. These patients have elevated levels of MMPs and inflammatory markers. And so the ability to combine something like AHA, which inhibits MMPs, to some of these diabetic patients, um, you know, drastically uh, improves the ability for, for example, collagen uh, membranes to basically last longer. And I'll show some of the data that we've obtained. Now this is a very simple um, illustration that just explains where hyaluronic acid has its function. So of course, blood clot, for those that work in the perio field know that blood clot formation is very, very important for periodontal regeneration. Anytime you wanna regenerate an intrabony defect, number one thing you wanna obtain, of course, is having a clot. Once that, that clot forms inside the periodontal pocket, of course, that's when you can start to have regeneration. And so HA stabilizes um, and it attaches to fibrinogen. And I'll show some examples of this from a video from Dr. Poloni, uh, where you can actually see it and how it, it's water loving. Um, then during the inflammatory st stage, like I said, it regulates inflammation and basically, what it does is it's able to reduce inflammation because it's able to act on MMPs. And I'll show some studies. The best example that I can give from that is its ability um, to regulate basically uh, inflammation in diabetic animals and, and humans. Um, when it comes to regeneration, this is proliferation here, the work that we've done from my own lab. So it obviously supports cell proliferation and differentiation. And there's also a high molecular weight HA and a low molecular weight HA, and I'll explain what they're both utilized for. And then, of course, with remodeling, uh, regulates collagen and avoids uh, formation of scars. And that's really clinically when, when clinicians are going to use this stuff. This is really what you see. You see an ability to lower inflammation. Okay, so that's obviously here, and your patients will report less pain, okay, less swelling as well. So the studies have already been done, and I'll show the data. Also, it's able to increase regeneration, and it avoids scarring. So it's really an attractive material, uh, mainly utilized for soft tissues as well, okay. Now, today, like I said, it's got many uses. The two big ones are in facial aesthetics. So here we see the dermatology, um, but it's got many different applications in many fields of medicine. The two biggest ones are dermatology and also, and also for osteoarthritis. Always remember that hyaluronic acid is found in basically any type of connective tissue. And I'll show some data where it's, it's found in, in periodontal ligaments as well, okay? The one that we typically use is the high molecular weight hyaluronic acid. Uh, reason why this one here is the one that promotes healing and regeneration. 
if you use low molecular weight hyaluronic acid, this typically is a sign of inflammation. So basically as tissues break down, hyaluronic acid also breaks down and then you have a little bit of a quote unquote danger zone here. Now, as it's being degraded, it will also increase angiogenesis. So um, we typically always use and recommend the high molecular weight one. And then there's ability to cross link it as well, which I'll explain a little bit later. Okay, so again, today, what do we use hyaluronic acid for? And I'll show some videos. Um, hyaluronic acid is used primarily in the dermatology field. It's got many, many years of expertise. So it's used for injection as well as for creams. I would say probably mostly for creams. Um, and it's also used in the field of osteoarthritis, okay? So where it became popular first would be in hyaluronic acid for facial applications. So it's funny because we, we do some courses with platelet-rich fiber and facial aesthetics where I collaborate with medical doctors and, and they absolutely love hyaluronic acid for two reasons. One, it improves hydration of skin. So you can see from this is actually a 45 year old uh, female and you can see her skin has absolutely you know, no wrinkles. She looks you know, quite good. Uh, the ability for hyaluronic acid to hydrate skin and then it's got the scarless potential as well because healing occurs via TGF beta 3 and collagen 3. And I'll explain the data a little bit later. So, typically in the facial field, I'll just show a quick little video here. This is from uh, YouTube. I always show people that okay. it's still. This is microneedling. So, it's a technique that's very common in our field. And you'll see her talk about hyaluronic acid here. Fabulous hairdo and Okay. Skin, and I've taken an alcohol wipe and uh, finished that off. Here I have again my hyaluronic acid. So, hyaluronic acid is used so a lot in that field. My microneedle is I have a pretty planned out. I'm going to start here and I can dial up the. Uh, so, this right here is a little microneedling device, and basically what it's doing is it makes these little perforations in the skin, tiny little holes. And that allows the hyaluronic acid to go into the skin. So that's pretty awesome. Okay. Yeah, so here. this right here and is what's being done every single day in, the, in this go, field. Uh, down, across, and then diagonal through that square. And then I move on. Okay, so that's basically how that field there works. And then you'll see she applies the hyaluronic acid with water. And because I'm using HA, I'm choosing to also use water because I want to drive the water and the hyaluronic acid into. Okay, so that's one of the main uh, areas where it's utilized. Again, what are you doing? You're hydrating skin, okay? You're preventing scar formation, and this is going to improve basically the ability to reduce wrinkles in that field. And it's the same reason why you can get rid of wrinkles in the facial field and why we can eliminate scars in the periodontal field. Okay. Now, whenever we look histologically at uh, developing tissues, you find this is obviously developing uh, teeth here. This uh, stain in brown is very high expression of hyaluronic acid. One of the highest places that hyaluronic acid is expressed in developing tissues is in teeth, okay, around the PDL. And so based on these findings, a lot of researchers started saying, you know, maybe we can use hyaluronic acid, which is also called hyaluron in here, and its potential role in periodontal wound healing. And you'll notice here, these papers are dating back to 2002. So it's been known for, you know, close to 20 years now that people have been doing research on what's the role of hyaluronic acid, why is it so highly expressed in periodontal tissues, on and on and on. And then the next questions became, can we use it for periodontal regeneration? Okay, this is a diagram that's coming obviously from, uh, from Ragadent, but it's just, it's a nice diagram. The reason why I included it is because it really simply explains what is the role of hyaluronic acid. So number one, like I said, it attracts blood. Of course, it's, it's going to stabilize coagulation and that's done with fibrinogen. Okay, and then there are some bacteriostatic effects. Uh, but more importantly, it, it releases growth factors, and these growth factors are attracted by hyaluronic acid, and it decreases and controls inflammation, okay? That's where it's utilized. I would actually put a sixth one here, which I think is extremely important, and that's reduction of scar formation, okay? So as a clinician, that's where there's really a huge advantage to use HA. Now, over the years, of course, there's been a lot of ability to take different products and make them cross-linked versus non-cross-linked. So basically, it's a process, and whenever you buy hyaluronic acid, you have two choices, to buy the non-cross-linked one or the cross-linked. My preference, of course, is always to use the cross-linked one, and you'll see a lot of the studies have been using the cross-linked one. The advantage of the cross-linked is basically the molecule is cross-linked, so it lasts longer. 
Okay, just like with barrier membranes, if they're cross-linked, typically they last longer. Because HA can be very quickly uh, absorbed in the body, if you cross-link these molecules, then it'll last, you know, four to six weeks. So you get a nice slow and gradual release of, of HA over time. Um, this is the component that we've done all of our research with. So in the lab, uh, we started working with high indent. This was a number of years ago, uh, probably I would say around the year 2014, 2015. And um, it's got a concentration of 1.8%, um, and most of it is cross-linked, as you can see. So that's one that we've done research with. Now, you'll notice as well in our studies, we always compare non-cross-linked versus cross-linked. In actual studies, if they're in vitro, you'll see very similar results between the two. When you go to clinics and animal models, that's where the cross-linking will typically last longer because again, then the resorption properties typically last four to six weeks, okay? So when you're applying this stuff, always remember that it's gonna last you know, a month, a month and a half. And there's been, again, many basic research studies that have shown uh, hyaluronic acid here, properties for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine are significantly improved with cross-linking, okay? And this produces a hydrogel. I'll show you guys some SEM photos of what it looks like to have actually this molecule and what it looks like and the reason why it lasts so long. And I'll also show some work that we've done with growth factors to show um, how long these growth factors can be released if you use this cross-linking uh, version of it. So we started doing work with this. Uh, again, I had the huge benefit of being in Bern, Switzerland when we first started with this. And of course, Tony Schoolian's done, uh, again, one of the top soft tissue guys that I know. Um, he does cases like this routinely all the time. And it, for these types of cases, again, he's using the cross-linked hyaluronic acid. And you'll notice when you look at these before and after cases, and there's many of them in our, in our textbook, uh, you can hardly tell that anything was done. Okay, that's number one. Number two, it's very difficult to see where the scars are being formed. Okay, and that's where clinicians today are utilizing this product for the ability, A, to regenerate tissues and also to try and uh, minimize scar formation when they do these types of surgeries. Okay, so we first started doing research with this. So you see, this is our group in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, a lot of credit here goes to Masako. She's still in Bern right now. Um, and we had other collaborators here, Heinz and uh, Adrian Lucy, Tony Schoolian, and Patrick Smeedling, and myself. Um, I was head of preclinical research. So I ran the preclinical lab, and we've done a lot of work now with PDL cells. When we look at what's going on with these uh, cells when they get exposed to hyaluronic acid, and here's hyaluronic acid non-cross-linked, okay, in different concentrations, so diluted one to 100, one to 10, so the higher the concentration here, the more activity we see, the more collagen synthesis we see, the more proliferation we see. And this is very similar, whether we use cross-linked or non-cross-linked in vitro, it doesn't make a difference. As long as the, the hyaluronic acid is there, these cells behave very positively, okay? Uh, very bioactive molecule here. Um, we've done some other work as well with looking at osteoblast differentiation. And it was interesting, uh, ODM stands for osteogenic differentiation media. And so hyaluronic acid is an interesting molecule in the sense that if, if you place it in certain areas, sometimes it will not induce bone formation. Other times it will induce bone formation. It's really specific on the environment that you place hyaluronic acid in. And today I know um, Maria, who's now in Bern, Switzerland with Tony Schoolian, are looking at the ability for HA to basically hold the plasticity of some of these stem cells. Um, more interesting for us was we then took a study and we looked at the ability for HA and the changes that will occur to dentin. So we were basically simulating what happens if we coat HA on a root surface, okay, and then we put PDL cells, what happens with the survival attachment and spreading of these cells. Okay, so this is dentin. This is what this is scanning electron microscopy. This is different, um, um, different SEM zooming. So basically, this is 50 microns, 200 microns, and this is uh, 20 uh, micrometers here. So you can see what it looks like. And then when you coat it with HA, the regular one, you don't really see too much going on here. You see a small coating. When you have the actual cross-linking molecule, that's when it actually gets coated, and it's almost like a glue. So the one thing that's interesting about this molecule, two things. One, it's cross-linked, so it really binds to the actual surface. And two, it attracts and binds with blood. So of course it forms that blood clot and I'll show videos that basically uh, explain this. So for those that are interested in looking at, this is a live dead assay, of course all the cells stay alive. Okay, this is a completely uh, uh, biological material. Of course it's found normally in tissues. Okay, so this is different than using a growth factor 
that's derived from other origin or a type of uh, product that is not found in the body. Hyaluronic acid is found naturally in the body. And so cells, when they're exposed to hyaluronic acid, there's no risk of having necrosis uh, of any kind. Okay, so cells viability stays at 100% for basically any samples at any concentrations. Now, uh, more recently over the years, when we started seeing these clinical results with respect to it basically wiping out scars. So, you know, we do surgery, we go with Schoolian, and we, we see less scar formation. It's very interesting to note that when we look at scarless fetal wound healing and you look at basic science studies, this was published by, look, these are all medical doctors, and they look at their embryologists, this was published in 2010. When you look at the capacity for scarless repair here um, is initially attributed to sterile environment, of course, amniotic fluid is rich in what? In hyaluronic acid. Okay, and it's one of the reasons why we see uh, these interesting findings. When you read the, the study further, you also notice that treatment of adult wounds with exogenous TGF beta 3 reduces scar formation. And this suggests that the ratio of TGF beta 3 um, actually determines whether uh, tissues regenerate or not. So, one of the things in the facial field is that they've shown routinely that HA improves TGF beta 3, okay, not TGF beta 1, which we're all common with. TGF beta 1 causes more fibrosis. TGF beta 3 causes more scarless wound healing. And when we look at cells then that are exposed to this, and this was a study again that was done in Bern, when they looked at the activity of two hyaluronin preparations, um, and I would recommend that a lot of people read this study right here because it's a really interesting one, published last year in August. Very recent study. What do you see? When you apply cells to HA, TGF beta 3, up to threefold increased, okay? Here up to fourfold increase. So you see a huge increase in TGF beta three, and this is the reason why wounds heal with less scars, okay? Uh, very interesting finding. It's something that you can communicate with your patients. As well, collagen 3A uh, is also upregulated. So these two markers here are what's responsible for scarless healing, okay? Significant increase in collagen 3A and TGF beta. There was little effect on collagen 1 and TGF beta. This is more fibrotic healing. And it obviously increases some other growth factors that are responsible for um, healing. So again, the most attractive thing for using HA, in my opinion, in a clinical setting is, again, its ability to stabilize a clot for intrabony defects and its ability to form scarless wound healing. And when I show you the video of Dr. Poloni doing a surgery with HA, watch how he uses it because he always applies it to areas where he thinks scars are going to form. Okay? Now, HA has a very, very long track record of being utilized in studies. Of course, high dent is a new material. Not a lot of people know about it. But as in research, when you look at my textbook on all the work that's been done for HA on bone regeneration, there's been a number of studies that support it. Okay, So for those that want more info on this, you can communicate with me and I'll, I'll send you some of the data that we have from our textbook. Uh, this is in the next generation biomaterials. There's been over 30 to 40 studies on HA. And here's HA for non-surgical periodontal treatment. Again, these are human studies, randomized clinical studies. A lot of them have been, been done, and I'll show one that was published last year from Dr. Poloni. Okay? This is a case that was done by Dr. Schoolian. Um, again, he's doing all of these techniques now with HA. And HA is utilized basically to minimize scar formation. Okay, and I'll show a video a little bit later here. The quality is a little bit low from the textbook here. But again, whenever you look at these wounds afterwards, really there's minimal scars, if not no scarring that occurs as a result of using HA. Okay. Andrea Poloni, for those that are living in Europe, he's an Italian colleague. Um, if you ever have a chance to hear him lecture on HA, I highly recommend it. He's probably the person that's most knowledgeable on this topic. And again, I, I spent some time with him in, in Europe uh, at Europerio, just discussing it with him. Uh, he spent a lot of time at UCLA in California doing research with HA. I would say he's probably one of the leading experts. He's recently done a study uh, looking at coronal advanced flap using, again, HA uh, for Miller Class 1s. And again, one of the things you see very nicely is all the reduction in scar formation, and that's reported in that study there. Okay, so here's a little video uh, that's performed by, again, Dr. Poloni. So again, that's giving him a lot of credit. I'm going to, again, show where he's located. So he works in, in Rome and in Italy um, and a professor there. So again, this is all standard, right? Everybody knows how to do these procedures. People do them differently. What I want to show is just the application of how uh, this high dent is being applied. Okay, so this is all common again now. Okay, application of the high dent. Now, first thing you're going to do, of course, 
you're going to apply it. Now, take a look. There's two things that I want you to observe. Look at how it's attracted to blood. Okay, and this is a very hydrophilic molecule, of course. If you do the same procedure with another type of growth factor, okay, um, a lot of times it will actually repel blood. Okay, and if you mix blood together with, let's say, other molecules, uh, example can be endogain, for instance, a more hydrophobic, you really have to make sure all the blood is completely away. When you look at this molecule, you can tell it's really attracted to blood. Now, see what he's doing right here? Applying the hyaluronic acid entirely on the entire area that's been cut. Okay, so that's very, very important. Why is he doing that? Well, because he knows that it's going to reduce scar formation. Okay, so anywhere where you've made incisions, anywhere where there's openings, you're going to run the hyaluronic acid product along the edges of all your wound. Why? Because you know how it works. Okay, so it's going to minimize scar formation that's going to occur there. Okay, then, of course, he coronally advances the flaps, which is just closed. Okay. Now, okay. We've done a lot of research on this, um, and of course, that's how you apply it clinically. And again, if you ever have the chance to learn from Dr. Poloni or Dr. Schoolian, uh, those are two real big experts that are using it. And again, if you're going to work with this stuff clinically, always remember it's going to minimize scar formation. So always apply it on the edges of wounds, anywhere where you've made an incision, that's where you want to be applying uh, the hyaluronic acid because it's going to minimize scars. Okay? Now, today, what do we do today with... Um, hyaluronic acid and where's the future research going. So my group is really involved in growth factor research, as I'm sure you know, um, and, and we're looking at utilizing hyaluronic acid in the cross-linking form as a delivery vehicle for growth factors. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we've been combining it with PureF as well because both of them have different properties. PureF is helpful for angiogenesis um, and hyaluronic acid is helpful for growth factor release. Um, as well as for a scarless wound healing. So we can combine them actually together. And that's being utilized a lot in the facial aesthetic field. And number three, we've been combining it with things like bone grafts for intrabony defect regeneration, as well as with barrier membranes. And I'll share some of the results that we have now from a very recent paper uh, in diabetic animal models. Okay? So the first paper that we published, I believe this was in 2017, we did this. We used hyaluronic acid as a gel-based scaffold as a potential carrier for growth factors. Uh, and I think, and to the best of my knowledge, this is one of the first times that anybody's ever done uh, this type of study. And what we were doing, again, this is what HA looks like in its cross-linking formulation. So it's really, really cool. You apply it, and this is on a little glass dish here. After it gets exposed to oxygen and sits there for a little while, it almost forms like a cross-linking, like a microsphere, if you want to call it, where it's, it's more dense. And then what you can actually do is this thing then lasts four to six weeks. So one of the issues with growth factors, BMPs uh, are used very commonly in North America, is that they have a very short half-life. So for instance, BMP2 has a half-life on the order of minutes, maximum hours. And unless you have a good uh, growth factor release system, uh, it doesn't work very effectively because you want these growth factors to be sent out for a long period of time. When we premix BMPs with hyaluronic acid, they get incorporated inside the HA. And then instead of lasting only a few minutes to hours, we can make these growth factors then last for days, days to weeks, okay? So this is some of the work that we did with BMP9. It was very interesting, where once the growth factor is incorporated within the hyaluronic acid, even 10 days later, there was still a lot of growth factor left, okay? And we stopped at 10. 10 days because usually by 10 days, most growth factors are completely gone. In this case here, I would expect these growth factors to last two, three, four, uh, maybe all the way up to six weeks. Okay, so it's very interesting and it's an interesting molecule here to be utilized. And um, again, we can then combine it and look at the data where HA is improving uh, osteogenesis. Okay, so here's another study where we looked at a lizard and red staining. Basically, simply put, the more red you see, the more bone formation. This is normal cells. Okay, when you add HA, of course, these cells get happier. They're going to make a little bit more bone. And whenever you combine them with the BMPs inside, then you really maximize how much uh, bone formation you can make. So that's one avenue of research that we've done preclinical animal models and, and going into clinics. And the one that's very interesting for us as well is all the work that's been done with hyaluronic acid loaded with antibiotics, for instance. Okay. In North America, we have a lot of different uh, products, such as Arrestin, for example. A lot of these little periochip, Okay, these are antibiotic chips that are loaded with polymers. 
okay? And these polymers, basically, you take these little polymers, you put it in a periodontal pocket, you let it sit there, and then it releases slowly over time uh, the antibiotic, okay? And a lot of people use this stuff, okay? and I'm always surprised by that because I'm not a big fan of using polymers. And I've explained to people that, and we're doing research with this, you can, instead of using these polymers, because polymers, when they degrade, they become inflammatory, okay? The body and the immune system does not like polymers, but you still put these in periodontal pockets. Why? Because it's going to release antibiotics and control the periodontal disease. Instead of doing it that way, it's much easier, it's better for your body, and it's cheaper to just take a liquid antibiotic, mix it with hyaluronic acid as a carrier system, put it in a periodontal pocket then, and then let that, let that slowly and surely release the antibiotic between four to six weeks. Okay, so there's a, a lot of research, potential research that can be done here, absolutely. Um, another thing we do, of course, with all the work that we've done with platelet-rich fibrin, um, with the slow speed concept, you get the liquid PRF, and I'm sure a lot of people are, are familiar with this liquid PRF or IPRF. You can actually take this liquid PRF and mix it with the liquid hyaluronic acid. And we do this together, okay? This is from our facial field, where one side has PRF here, the other side has hyaluronic acid. You can mix them together back and forth like this. You get one of these little, this is called a female lure lock, okay? It's just a little connector. These are about a dollar US each. You mix it together, and then now I have a mixture of 50% hyaluronic acid, 50% PRF, and then I can go regenerate tissues with this. Okay, so that's also something that's very commonly used in facial aesthetics as well as in uh, you can use this for perio. Now, lastly, uh, I gave a presentation at Europerio related to um, uh, hyaluronic acid, and at the time, like I said, this was all future research, and I'm really happy to say that this was. Uh, quickly finalized. We had a master student, an excellent master student that finished this paper where we combined hyaluronic acid with uh, barrier membranes. Okay, And the whole goal here was to show that in these cases with diabetes, the one biggest problem with diabetes, of course, is their inflammatory response and the fact that tissues degrade faster. So if you put a collagen barrier membrane in a diabetic patient, it will not last, if, if the membrane is supposed to last eight weeks, in a diabetic patient, it will never last eight weeks, okay? Because of their condition, their medical related issues, um, these membranes degrade much, much faster. We know that. So that's been reported in the literature. Um, you'll notice here, look, April 2019, so only two months ago, two, three months ago, uh, this was published online. Hyaluronic acid slows down collagen membrane degradation in uncontrolled diabetic rats. And this was done by Dr. Maisie here, who was a student with us from Israel, but she was uh, working in in Switzerland, we had a lot of co-authors that, that helped us uh, with this. Half the group came from uh, Switzerland, the other half came from, um, from Israel. And in this study, basically what was interesting is that when we look at the amount of collagen in these areas, this right here, C minus, is just the collagen membrane, okay? How much of the collagen membrane is lasting after this eight-week period? When we have collagen with hyaluronic acid, okay, the collagen's still there. So you can see that the collagen barrier membrane in a normal animal model is holding its volume. Again, this is D for diabetes. If I have diabetes, then I lose more than half of my membrane, okay? And that's obviously not good because then it doesn't have the barrier function of, of excluding soft tissues. Interesting, and this is, I believe that this is a very, very big finding. Um, as long as you combine that barrier membrane, the collagen membrane with hyaluronic acid, because hyaluronic acid inhibits MMPs, that membrane will behave the exact same way as it does in a non-controlled animal, okay? Today, this should probably be well known to most people internationally. If you want your collagen membranes or you're gonna use a collagen membrane in a diabetic patient, it should almost be enforced that you use hyaluronic acid in those cases because of these findings, okay? These are very dramatic findings. And like I said, when we did the histology, again, here's your normal collagen membrane. Okay, you can see it's nice, it's being retained. Here's the collagen membrane with hyaluronic acid. So you can see it's, you know, it's keeping its shape and you'll see it's a little bit thicker here. And the reason for that is that, again, if you use that cross-linking molecule of hyaluronic acid, it's gonna hold its volume. Look at the diabetic patient, okay? That's unbelievable. I mean, this is a normal membrane and then because you have diabetes, that's what your membrane looks like. And of course, this is not going to uh, prevent soft tissue infiltration. And look at the diabetic patient now, as long as I add the hyaluronic acid, again, the cross-link, that holds that membrane and prevents it from being degraded because of the ability for hyaluronic acid to inhibit MMP production. 
Okay, very, very interesting finding. And again, when we looked at the soft tissue infiltration, you'll see all the groups look fine. Look at the diabetic patient. If you don't have the HA, you got more than two times more soft tissue infiltration. Okay, so very, very important finding that was published very, very recently. So in conclusion, when we go back and we look at hyaluronic acid as a molecule, again, it, it's got many functions. Um, again, first thing that's very interesting is that it's going to bind to fibrinogen, especially and stabilize a blood clot. So that's very important for wound healing, um, especially for intrabony defects. Second thing that it does, oh, in the inflammatory phase, again, it's going to regulate um, inflammation, and this is typically done by MMPs. So it's got a lot of functions there, especially with inflammatory cells. Very, very interesting. Like I said, it should be an indication. And I hope from this lecture that everybody knows that with diabetic patients, especially, and there's an ever growing number of diabetic, you know, citizens within our populations, very interesting to use HA on those membranes to prevent them from degrading. Okay. Last thing you want to do is buy this, you know, collagen membrane to prevent soft tissue infiltration and not having it act properly. Okay. You can prevent that by simply using HA. Uh, in those cases. Third, and this is the work that was done by my lab, uh, we've shown that HA is obviously helping a lot with proliferation um, and connective tissue formation. Okay, so that's well known and, and there's a lot of basic research studies that have shown this both in the dental field as well as in uh, the facial aesthetic field. Okay. And then lastly, of course, and this one here is very interesting for a lot of clinicians, especially those that are, are treating soft tissue cases, especially in the aesthetic zone, it's able to minimize scar formation. Okay, and that's very interesting. Again, this is done through TGF beta 3 production and collagen 3A1 production. Um, so, HA, like I said, is a very interesting molecule. And, and one of the things that I like a lot about um, Regadan as a company is that I found that they have very interesting new molecules that are kind of quote unquote next generation, if you want to call them. So, they're, they're stuff that are thinking really far outside the box. You know, why don't we use HA? Um, and, and that one there is, is going to have a big impact. Unfortunately, in North America, like I said, the FDA has not cleared HA for use. So unfortunately, we can't use it in North America yet. Uh, and I always am jealous of my European colleagues that get these materials earlier. Another such material that's available in Europe as well and still not available, unfortunately, in the United States is, is this osteoinductive uh, synthetic bone grafting material, and that's called Asopia. And again, this has a whole chapter in my textbook as well, and we've done a lot of work with this uh, material. This one here we've done work with since 2011, 2012. And I'm gonna go over bone grafting materials in general, uh, because we have our four classes, autogenous bone, which are blocks and also our particles, and show some research that we've done here. We have allogeneic bone, which is coming from human cadaver. This is what's most commonly utilized in the United States. So this is coming from another quote-unquote cadaver human bone. Xenografts, more commonly utilized in Europe. So this is our bioos and our animal models. Or, yeah, animal models, and then our synthetic alloplast materials, and this is made in a lab. These are our calcium phosphates, our polymers, our beta TCPs, our hydroxyapatite, etc. Now, naturally, all of these graphs have to be characterized. So this is something that was adapted by Simon Jensen. Oops, I'm going to go back. Oops. Okay, um, here's autographs, allographs, xenographs, and synthetic alloplasts. Of course, all these materials have to be biocompatible, safe, have good geometry and handling. Um, the way that we actually characterize grafting materials is based on these three properties here. Osteoconduction, osteoinduction, and osteogenic. Okay? And this is where there's differences between the different types of grafts. So osteogenic means that it contains living cells. So we can see here, our autographs have a plus. Everything else is a negative. So of course, naturally, if you grab autogenous bone, from the same patient, it's got living cells, makes sense. Next one, osteoconduction. What does that mean? It means that the graft has an ability to make bone. That's it, very simple. It means that if I take a bone cell, I place it on the bone graft, it will make bone, okay? If I place the bone graft and I place it in a bone defect, it will make bone, okay? So you'll see here, every single one of these materials, of course, is osteoconductive, naturally, okay? Otherwise, it would not be on the market. Now, when we do preclinical research, sometimes we'll get a grafting material that gets sent to us in our lab for testing. Uh, we go ahead, we take the new material. It's about to get CE approved, CE cleared, FDA approved. We put it in an animal model and it actually will not form bone. Okay, maybe it forms fibrous encapsulation. Maybe it forms cartilage. It doesn't make bone. 
In those cases there, those grafts are not osteoconductive. Okay, they never make it to market either. Now, interestingly, there's this osteoinductive phenomenon, and that's where there's a real advantage. So the difference between conducing bone means it's conductive. Inductive means it's got more regenerative properties, so it's inducing bone. And I'll show the model of how we test that in a few slides. The way that we test that is we take grafting materials and we place them in areas where bone should not be formed. So example is muscle. If I take a bone graft and I put it in muscle and it makes bone right in the middle of muscle, then it's considered inductive. Okay, so the grafts that are osteoinductive are autografts and allografts. And there's a plus minus here. And the reason why there's a lot of variability, of course, that come from human allografts. Okay, xenografts such as bioos, no way. Synthetic materials, no way. Okay, so that's uh, how we characterize the grafting materials. Now, we know autogenous bone is a gold standard, of course. Um, and I'll show some data that we have from autogenous bone and a little piece of information for everybody uh, that's listening. But of course, most grafting procedures are not done with autogenous bone. Okay, most of them are done with some type of biomaterial uh, in order to prevent having to harvest this autogenous bone. Now, in Bern, Switzerland, uh, when I went there, uh, Dr. Boozer has done a lot of work. Of course, I give him a lot of credit for all the developing that he's done with different models, etc. This was one that's available to us across the street from the dental school in the basement. Uh, this is close to our medical school. Um, they've developed this animal model where this is a mini pig here. You open up where the ramus is and you can create these five to six millimeter defects. And uh, over the years, Dr. Boozer has basically put you know, every type of biomaterial you can think of. Autogenous bone, allografts, bioos, synthetic materials with a membrane, without a membrane. Over the years and, and literally every month they continue to do research, a very high quality research. So when I first moved to Bern, Switzerland in 2009, they were interested in trying to determine what is the best way to harvest bone, okay, autogenous bone. And so there's different ways to do this. First way, you can take the trephine, you take out these little uh, bone cylinders, you put them in a bone mill, scrunch, 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 you get these little particles. That's method number one. Other ways you can harvest bone, autogenous bone, you can use a piezo surgery device, okay? You basically just scratch the surface with the piezo surgery instrument. You can do it purely mechanically by using a bone scraper, where you basically just scrape the bone. And you can also use bone dust, where you take a, a burr and you just basically drill into this uh, little perforations. And with a suction device, you collect what's called bone dust here. Okay. Well, <clears throat> when I first went to Bern, of course, I was a molecular and cell biologist. And so they asked me to run a cell study. And first thing I did was I went to scanning electron microscopy. So here's the different grafting materials. Here's one millimeter in size. So you can see the bone mill is the biggest. You can see the scraper here forms these swirlies. The bone dust, of course, is the smallest and, and piezo surgery is somewhere in the middle here. Now, when we look at this in high resolution, Okay, this is high resolution scanning electron microscopy. This right here is five microns in size. So now you can actually start to see proteins. You can actually start to see the collagen fibers, okay, here. You can see the fiber network that's being formed here on the scraper. What was interesting from this is that the piezo surgery and the bone dust completely devoid of proteins, okay. There was very few proteins that were found on their surfaces. It was basically a pure hydroxyapatite surface, okay. And one of the reasons that we concluded from that is that uh, if you look back to this uh, slide here, these two methods here, whenever you're harvesting autogenous bone, you're always rinsing continuously with saline. And that saline is basically rinsing away growth factors at all times. Whereas the scraper is purely mechanical, there's no saline rinse and you're keeping a lot of the proteins and the bone mill, you're basically scrunching this up afterwards and uh, you're retaining a lot of the collagen fibers. Of course, whenever you take a mill, such as this one here, you also get a little bit of uh, trabecular bone. Now we then ran cell studies as well. So here uh, is the number of cells. Here's the mill, okay, first one. Second is piezo surgery, bone dust and scraper. You see the mill and the scraper performing better than all other groups. A okay, very interesting finding. The mill worked the best, of course, but it's more invasive. The scraper worked quite well, um, and it's a lot less invasive. So that's the one that typically is recommended in the in the Department of Oral Surgery at the University of Bern. A summary from this this study: uh, more surface proteins on the mill and scraper. Avoid harvesting techniques with washing, extensive washing, and of course the bone cells seated on the mill and scraper also attach and differentiate faster. From that study, we also did a second study where we looked at um, the cell viability. 
And the way that we do this is that if you look into each one of these wells, there's 100 milligrams of bone chips. So here you can see the little bone particles, 100 milligrams in triplicates from three different animals. Same thing here, 100 milligrams each, 100 milligrams each. And then what we do is we put a clear solution. It's called an MTS assay. And the solution goes from clear to yellow to orange to red, depending on how many cells are alive. And what we see here is very drastically um, there's two that work very well. And of course, what was surprising from this study was the fact that the piezo surgery here was actually wiping out the majority of these cells. Okay, so it's uh, interesting findings for those that want to read those papers are quite interesting. Now, <clears throat> this is data from my textbook. Whenever I was writing the textbook on biomaterials, I got all the data from North America for which materials are being utilized most frequently. And what you'll notice here is look at the autographs. Autographs is only 15% of cases. So even though we know that it's a standard material, it's utilized literally in one in 10 cases. And more often than not, the average uh, GP, the average dentist is not using autographs. This is typically reserved for oral surgeons and oral maxillofacial surgeons, as well as some periodontists, okay? Majority of people, what are they using in North America? They're using allografts and they're using xenografts or, okay, demineralized bone matrix, which is basically BFDBA, okay, allografts here. Big, big, big component. Interesting was the fact that, look, synthetic materials, only 5% of the population is using synthetic materials. BMPs, 5% as well. These are growth factors, okay? These are the growth factors that induce bone. So in US, one in 20 cases is being regenerated today with a growth factor, okay? That's a surprising finding. And I know a lot of European colleagues are surprised when they see this data because it's not utilized very frequently in Europe. Synthetic materials, why don't more people use synthetic materials? Why are they utilized so infrequently? To be quite honest, they don't make bone as well as uh, the other materials, okay? In general, for a number of years, these synthetic materials were poorly, they were poor bone makers. And of course, it ruined, quote unquote, the taste in a lot of uh, dentists' mouths by using these synthetic materials because when they're not working as well, they stop using them. And then the term, quote unquote, synthetic, uh, most people don't want anything to do with synthetic materials today. Okay? Now, um, this whole osteoinductive field, again, this was the person that developed that whole field. His name is Marshall Urist. And he, in his classic study in 1965, found out that if you demineralize bone matrix, it becomes, it makes ectopic bone, okay? So again, when you put it in muscle, it will actually make bone in the middle of muscle. And he found that from the allografts. And then he was interested, he was asking himself, I wonder which protein inside this allograft is actually making bone. And it took him six years from 1965 to 1971, he figured out what that set of proteins were and he called it bone morphogenetic protein two, okay? So that's what's utilized today clinically in the United States in 5% of cases, okay? And uh, this is the model that we use. So again, we do a lot of work with the FDA or the CE to get materials approved. Are they osteoinductive? Are they not? And we've done this study here hundreds of times where we literally take these animals, okay? This is a rat. We open up the femur at the femur area. In the muscle here, we place a biomaterial. Okay, so we can put BMPs here, we can put an allograft here, we can put autogenous bone here, and then we find out which ones are making bone right in the middle of muscle. Okay, if it does, it's osteoinductive. If it doesn't, it's not osteoinductive. And here's an example of that. So here's BMPs, and remember, BMP is a liquid. So here's BMP, here's the femur, here's the liquid at different concentrations, and that liquid is actually turning into bone. Okay, so BMPs is only one of two uh, FDA approved biomaterials for the production of, uh, for, for uh, osteoinduction. And that's why I always say the future of medicine has a lot to do with growth factors, whether it be BMPs, endogain, hyaluronic acid, these types of growth factors should be used in a lot more cases than they are today, okay? Unfortunately, BMP is very expensive, okay? This is around $800 US uh, per case, minimum. And our group in Bern, Switzerland, we did a lot of work with these uh, BMPs in the field of osteoinduction. So this is a, an old folder from 2010. Uh, this is Yufeng Zhang. He's the co-author of the textbook that I wrote on biomaterials. He lived in Bern, Switzerland as well with me for a number of months. And we did a lot of research together. Now today, when we published this in 2012, okay, we wanted to reestablish what does it mean for biomaterial to be osteoinductive. 
Okay, so many years ago, you know, in the 60s and 70s, Marshall Ure said, take a material, put in muscle, it's also inductive. And that's very straightforward, it's easy. But the reality is today we can do a lot more testing to figure things out. So today we can actually follow cells and animal models and track where they're going, etc. So first things first, we need mesenchymal stem cells to be recruited to the grafting material surface. That's number one step. Afterwards, we need these stem cells to become bone forming osteoblasts. And then when they become these bone cells, of course, then they need to lay a new bone matrix. Okay, very straightforward. And this we test right here in the ectopic model in muscle. So this paper here was one that came out from a group in Netherlands. Um, very interesting study. This is a group of um, orthopedic surgeons. And again, for those that want to know more, most things that we have in dentistry come from medicine first. Okay, so they develop something in medicine and then we utilize it in dentistry. Allografts developed in medicine, we use it then in, in dentistry. Same thing with uh, the synthetic material. Same thing with hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid was first utilized in medicine. And then once it's confirmed safety, et cetera, then we start using it in dentistry and figure that things, things are working out. This is no different here. Now it was recently proposed that certain types of biphasic calcium phosphates, so this is synthetic material, without the use of growth factors is also inductive. When I first saw this paper, I said, that's absolutely incorrect. I said, there's no way, okay? Because no material that was synthetic that we had ever tested has ever been also inductive. Um, and then we read more in the paper and it was published in PNAS. And for those that don't know this journal, this is a very, very high impact factor journal and they don't publish just any science. So it's very, very high quality journal publishing high quality science. Um, so we looked into it and we said, wow, ever interesting. If that works in the orthopedic field, why don't we try and do some testing in the dental field? And so we did that. So I collaborated again with our group in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, I want to introduce two more people here. This is Dieter Bosart. He's done a lot of work with me um, when I was living in Bern, Switzerland. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for all the work that he's done. He's probably considered the top oral histologist of the whole world. Um, and of course, Reinhard Gruber down here, he was initially the head of the cell biology lab. And uh, he went back to Vienna afterwards, a full uh, professor and chair of the department. And I've learned a lot from him as well. And this is Dr. Shandad, who I work with in Canada that was head of uh, research in, uh, in Canada. And so we wanted to compare this new grafting material and this grafting material actually at the time, we just called it a quote unquote normal biphasic calcium phosphate. Um, this is actually a SOPIA. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to compare a SOPIA to autographs, which we knew were also inductive, to xenografts, which was BIOS, and also to demineralized freeze-dried bone allograft from LifeNet and Health that we knew was also inductive because we had tested it and made sure that it's making uh, bone and muscle. Okay, so this is what the graph looks like. So if anybody's interested to know more about uh, these papers, uh, this is one that's been highly cited so far, publishing clinical oral implants research in 2016, where we looked at the topography of asopia. So of course it's roughened and we know from implant studies that cells typically like roughened surfaces. No surprises there. Um, interesting, first thing I did when I had the graph, I said, let's compare this to an allograph because I knew allografts were the standard. So I took the DFDBA, I compared it to this new synthetic material, and sure enough, all of these genes that are important for osteoblast differentiation and basically bone formation were all being upregulated, okay? So the, we said to ourselves, okay, that's interesting. Let's do the full study. So here's the autograph here, here's the allograft, here's the xenograft, this is BIOS. Okay. For those that want to know more about BIOS, again, the scientific name of BIOS in studies, they always call it deproteinized bovine bone mineral. Deproteinized means no proteins, no proteins, no cells. It's just a pure hydroxyapatite surface. And when you look at this new synthetic material, um, you can see, look, all these microtopographies. So you can see a lot of porous material with a roughened uh, surface. Okay. And cells typically like that. Now, first thing that we did, uh, we want to look at migration. How do we test cell migration? We use a trans well assay. The way that this works, we put cells up here. So all these cells are sitting here and they're sitting on top of these tiny little pores. Okay. And then what we do is we introduce a biomaterial or a growth factor here at the bottom. And if the cell likes the material down here, it basically squeezes through the pores. It goes through and then we can count them and then we can count the cells down here. So when we do this work here, we see autogenous bone and allograft are both recruiting cells. 
BIOS and Asopia are not recruiting any cells at all. Okay, so we pondered this question. So only autogenous bone and DFDBA were recruiting these cells. Why did this happen? Because autogenous bone and allografts have growth factors. There's no growth factors in BIOS, there's no growth factors in Asopia, and therefore there's no ability here to recruit cells from these two molecules. Next thing we did, we looked at cell proliferation. We wanted to see how often are these cells being replicated. Sure enough, again, autogenous bone performing better than every single group. So only autogenous bone here was able to induce cell proliferation. Okay, this is the number of cells that are growing over time. Last thing, cell differentiation. So in this case here, we took stem cells and we put stem cells on each one of these grafting materials. And then we asked the question, how many of these stem cells now have turned into bone forming osteoblasts? And this was after three days. And this is where it got really interesting. Why? Because this new synthetic material, for reasons at the time we didn't understand. Today we understand how it works. When I did the study originally, I had no idea how this material was working. Sure enough, Asopia is increasing osteoblast differentiation when compared to all the other groups, even autogenous bone after three days. Okay, very surprising finding. And then after 14 days, okay, of course, autogenous bone catches up and in some cases surpasses it. But it was the first time we've ever seen any type of regenerative property from a synthetic material of this kind. Okay, uh, very interesting studies. And again, it's a quite highly cited study uh, that I published here. Now, this BCP, without the use of growth factors, again, here, we put it in muscle. So this right here in white, this is the bone graft. This is the bone graft. This is the bone graft. Everything in blue is bone, okay? And imagine, we're clinicians, we open up a muscle, we put the graft in, a synthetic material. We're almost laughing at the time. We're like, we're gonna go back in in six weeks or eight weeks, pull out these little synthetic particles. No, what did we take out? We took out a chunk of bone. Okay, from a synthetic material. It was the first time we've ever seen that. And that was very, very interesting for our group. And one of the reasons why we had done a lot more research on this uh, material since then. Okay, I, from my perspective, it's one of the most interesting materials available. Um, and I think a lot more work needs to be done in that field there. Now, of course, when you look at all the types of grafting materials, uh, it's a no brainer. Autogenous bone is a standard. Only disadvantage of autogenous bone and reason why there's a question mark here, it resorbs fast, right? With autogenous bone, sometimes we would put it in muscle and we go back in after six or eight weeks, it's gone. There's nothing left, okay? It made bone and resorbed bone so quickly that you don't have anything there. You know, again, you can ask a five-year-old which one of these materials is not working very well. And of course, the xenograft here has no inductive properties. Now, if you go back to the data in the United States, the xenografts are used in 20% of cases in North America. One in five grafting cases are being performed with xenografts. Why is that? typically because they're non-resorbable, okay? So they're absolutely needed in many indications. Example is uh, a lot of people will use it in a sinus grafting procedure. Why? Because it's non-resorbable, okay? So there's a lot of places. Another example is Dr. Boozer's work with contra augmentation, right? The outer layer is always done with a xenograft. Why? Because it's non-resorbable. If you use another material, probably the results would not be as well. So there's definitely uses of it, but when we speak on its bone inductive properties, it's not very good, okay? Synthetic materials before this should never have been used because they're not inductive at all and they're resorbable. So there was really no role for using BCP. And it was interesting, this is the first time we've seen uh, inductive properties from a synthetic biomaterial. And I think that's very interesting and we've continued to do more work with it. Next thing we asked ourselves, I wonder, because it's got no growth factors, no ability to recruit cells, why don't we take BMPs, which are commonly utilized in the United States, and combine it with this synthetic material, right? Makes sense. BMPs are gonna recruit cells. BMPs the liquid, it's not a scaffold. We've got a great scaffold here that's able to transform stem cells into bone cells, and they both make ectopic bone. So let's put them together and let's do a study. So we did this in 2016, uh, it was published, um, and I did this with UFUNC, of course. Addition of a synthetically fabricated osteoinductive BCP with BMP2 and its ability to improve bone formation. So when we do these types of studies, the first thing we do is we always create critical size defects. What does it mean for a defect to be critical size? It means that if I make a defect of this size in that animal model, it will never heal. Okay, so again, if you make a small little tiny defect 
it will naturally heal. But if you make a critical size defect, it will never heal. And so we always try and do research as much as possible with critical size defects because then when we introduce biomaterials, if the biomaterials are working very well, then of course uh, they should regenerate these critical size defects. And here with Sopia, that's exactly what that did. After eight weeks, this critical size defects fully regenerated. Same thing here. You can do BMPs, okay? This is also an osteoinductive material and at higher concentrations, it will regenerate that bone defect. And that's amazing. When I think of how amazing that is, that's a liquid that's literally closing a critical size defect with a liquid growth factor. And again, I cannot stress this enough. You know, these growth factors are really the future of medicine. And I think a lot more clinicians should take advantage of these growth factors because it's really where the future of regeneration is going. Now, problem here, this biomaterial is, you know, a few hundred US dollars or maybe 150 euros. I don't know the price exactly, but quite cheap. This right here is $800 US. Okay, so of course, this is fantastic, but of course, the cost is very, very high. Now, look at this. When we combine a sopia with these growth factors, look at this. This was after only eight weeks. Okay, unbelievable. Out of all the animal models that we've ever done in our careers, first time I've ever seen that much bone being formed in such a short period of time. And that's where when you really understand how uh, these graft materials work and the regenerative properties of growth factors versus scaffolds and how you might be able to combine them together, that's when you can start to maximize uh, bone formation. And of course, we've been doing a lot more work uh, on this topic since then. Now, Sopia, of course, um, very different than most synthetic materials. Uh, it's CE approved. So in Europe, you know, it's available for sale. Uh, you guys are lucky. I am not able to use it in private practice, although we do use it in university. Uh, I can tell you that personally, I've treated my, my mom with a colleague of mine who did the, the surgery. It was done with the Sopia. Okay, it's the material that I would recommend using um, as a top choice. And we're still waiting for FDA clearance. And I hope it happens faster uh, than not. And for those that have not worked with it in, in Europea, European markets, I would highly recommend uh, giving it a go. One thing that's important for this biomaterial is it's uh, different than most synthetic materials. That's always a question that I get asked and it's a very uh, interesting answer. And we've been learning more and more about the material over the years and I'll show some papers more recently. What the company did differently, again, this was produced in the Netherlands. So it was a group of researchers, basic scientists that, that developed this. They sinter, which means cooking the material at lower temperatures, whereas typically synthetic materials are cooked at high temperatures, and this makes them less inductive, or they're not osteoinductive at all, whereas when you cook them at lower temperatures, they basically remain osteoinductive, and of course, that goes into it besides just this, but this is one of the major differences here. Um, and it's, it's very interesting, uh, because one of the things that we've learned uh, more recently is since 2012, we were looking at the osteoinductive properties. And back then I was looking at, you know, how important it is for cells to be recruited and differentiate, et cetera. Um, the more and more research I've done, the more I've realized actually that immune cells are really the most important cells in biomaterial integration. That can be a dental implant surface, or it can be a bone graft material, or it can be a barrier membrane, or it can be a growth factor. Okay, and so Dieter Bosart and I, it was actually his idea to, to work on this topic. He had started seeing histologically how important these cells are. And so uh, they'd been called osteomax for osteomacrophages. So the macrophages, immune cells that are found in bone tissues. For those that want to read in interesting papers that are more on the basic science side, uh, this is a great article that explains why immune cells are so important during bone biomaterial integration. So that was one big finding that we found around the year 2015, published in 2016. And then uh, last year, I published with Mark Bonner, another Swiss colleague, and this is uh, the highest impact factor journal I'll probably ever published in my career in materials today. And it's really a fundamental understanding of how these synthetic materials are also inductive. And so we propose a mechanism for how this is actually working. And it has a lot to do with um, the material surface properties on how much calcium and phosphate are found on the actual scaffold surface. And so Dr. Bonner, uh, he's been doing a lot of work on this topic for a number of years where he produces actually 
calcium deficient hydroxyapatite surfaces. And so they've been doing all this research proposing making porous calcium deficient hydroxyapatite surfaces. And that's the reason why these materials are osteoinductive, they're calcium deficient. And then what happens, very simply put, you, got, you put in a calcium deficient molecule, it sucks all the calcium away from the microenvironment, then the environment becomes calcium deficient, then immune cells, macrophages, sense the fact that they're immune def uh, calcium deficient, and then they produce bone. They tell osteoblasts then to produce bone. That's basically a simple way to explain that. And um, in the publication, like I said, basically what's happening is um, you have a defect. When you have some physiological calcium and phosphate levels, and that's from the material surface, that's when you start having osteoblast differentiation and bone formation. Okay, so the idea today, and the one thing that he's been working on for a number of years now is how do we make, such as asopia, these calcium deficient and phosphate deficient surfaces, okay? And that's what drives uh, this bone formation here. So kind of interesting. And then in the paper, you can find all the normal calcium and phosphate levels and how they're lowered around some of these grafting materials and one of the reasons why they become inductive. Okay, so again, summary from the work that we've done with Asopia, don't underestimate the importance of immune cells. Okay, so that's really how these materials make a lot of bone. And um, as well, the osteoinductive phenomenon is largely driven by these osteomax. Okay, and it's when they encounter low calcium and low phosphates environments. Like I said, one of the things that's very important when we work with Asopia is to make sure that um, the immune system is very well regulated. Okay, so the immune cells, and what I mean by that is that one of the most important vitamins for uh, immune cell health is vitamin D, and of course that's the one that's very important for bone, and I would highly recommend that for these graphs to be very successful when they're driven by immune cells, make sure that your patients have sufficient vitamin D levels before you do grafting procedures or implant placement, okay? Um, so I want to thank everybody for your attention. This is my email address, uh, rick at the .com. If anybody would like any of the publications that I've discussed today, I have them all uh, available, so I'm happy to share them. And if anybody has questions after uh, this talk, I'm more than happy to, um, you know, answer them in a week from now or a month from now or whenever, whenever mm -hmm. you guys would like. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Rick, Professor Myron. <laughs> Um, do, does someone have a question? I'm just checking how we can uh, do that. Or you can do it, you can on, on, on the bottom of the, the window, you can find a, a, a question and answer, or you can as well through the chat send us some question. Okay. I have just one question because what I have seen is that uh, hyaluronic acid has some potential to support bone formation. We have seen in one study. And then you have osopia, yeah. which seems very promising. Uh, what do you think about yeah. the combination of the two? <laughs> uh, of course, uh, definitely would improve the results. Uh, you know, each one of these growth factors has uh, specific indications where they're, they're working very, very well, extremely well. And then there's other ones that are working maybe a little bit, but not as much as uh, in, in other indications. So for example, you know, BMPs are really the big ones for bone. So that's the one that's working best. Mm -hmm. Hyaluronic acid is fantastic for soft tissues and for scar formation, but naturally because it's found in connective tissues, it's also going to improve, um, uh, healing of bone defects. So a lot of people will combine it with a bone graft. And I know Dr. Poloni has done some studies for interbony defects, especially, right? If you already have the material out and you're applying it on the root surface and you plan on using it for scar formation, you know, you can very well combine it with your bone graft, put it in a bone defect and use it there as well. Okay. So does someone has a question? I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't see any questions as well, any questions and answers. So I want to thank Rick Myron for his very interesting and good talk. At least I, even though I am always in contact with the topics, I've learned a lot. And I want to thank as well to the participants uh, to have had uh, the time. And uh, I wish uh, now for, uh, Professor Myron a nice day and for those who are in Europe, a nice evening. Thank you, Rick Myron. 
and thank you to everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.